Hello, fellow neuroscience enthusiasts. This video is another installment of the Brain Preservation Foundation's Neuroscience Journal Club, in which we briefly review the results of a selected paper and discuss its relevance to the ongoing debate regarding brain preservation. Today's paper is a classic in the neuroscience literature, and according to Google Scholar, it has been cited 700 times since its publication in 2003. It is entitled Structure, Stability, Function, Relationships of Dendritic Spines by Kasai et al. It was published in the journal Trends in Neuroscience. A link to the paper is listed below. This is a really fantastic review paper that I highly recommend reading. It is a bit dated at 15 years old, but from what I have seen, its main conclusions have stood the test of time and later I will review some more recent work that has replicated and extended their results. As always, please note that although I will try my best to accurately relate the research, it is always possible that I may misinterpret something crucial. If I do, please let me know in the comments and I will try to correct it. This paper is just one of a whole host of papers we will be covering that seek to determine how memories are physically stored in the brain. I should also note that this is a review paper that leans heavily on the results of this earlier primary research paper from the same lab, entitled Dendritic Spine Geometry is Critical for AMPA Receptor Expression in Hippocampal CA1 Pyramidal Neurons. Reading from the abstract, quote, Dendritic spines, which receive most of the excitatory synaptic input in the cerebral cortex, are heterogeneous with regard to their structure, stability, and function. Spines with large heads are stable, express large numbers of AMPA-type glutamate receptors, and contribute to strong synaptic connections. By contrast, spines with small heads are motile and unstable and contribute to weak or silent synaptic connections. Their structure, stability, function relationships suggest that large and small spines are memory spines and learning spines, respectively. First off, let's quickly review what a dendritic spine is and why it is crucially important in the debates regarding how memories are encoded in the brain. This figure from Nimchinsky et al. 2002 shows a pyramidal neuron in the hippocampus which has been filled with a fluorescent dye and imaged using two-photon microscopy. The inset below shows that its dendritic branches are covered with thousands of tiny spines. This green arrow is pointing to one of them. This is an electron micrograph image, also of a pyramidal neuron in the hippocampus, from Born and Harris 2007. They have colored the electron micrograph to show a few dendritic spine synapses in cross-section. Below is a 3D reconstruction of a length of this dendrite reconstructed from a series of such electron micrographs. Note that the scale bar in the top figure and the scale cube in the bottom fig 3D figure are both 0.5 microns. This yellow arrow denotes the shaft of the dendrite, and here is the corresponding shaft in the previous two photon image. Born and Harris have also colored the thin neck of the spine in blue, and they have colored the bulging head of this mushroom shaped dendritic spine in green. And Born and Harris have colored the axon that makes a synaptic contact with this spine in brown. The corresponding axon is not visible in the two-photon light micrograph picture, since only the one neuron has been filled with fluorescent dye. But it should be understood that this neuron is embedded in a tangled mass of invisible axons, and that most of its many dendritic spines are making a synaptic contact with one of these axons. And the spines that are not are likely thin filopodia spines that were caught in the process of reaching out to make a new contact. It is impossible to overemphasize how important dendritic spines are to the functioning of the brain. One of the pioneers of the two-photon microscopic examination of dendritic spines, the prolific neuroscientist Rafa Yusta, has written an entire book focusing on them. 
It is one of my all-time favorite neuroscience books, and I highly recommend reading it to get a more complete picture of the field. I will devote many more journal clubs to covering the details of dendritic spines, but for now, I just want to remind you why they are so important. The majority of excitatory synapses in the brain occur on dendritic spines. More than 90% of the excitatory synapses terminate onto spines, and thus the human brain contains greater than 10 trillion dendritic spines. 85% of all cells in the cortex are spiny. And most importantly, our current best theories of how memories are stored in the cortex, hippocampus, striatum, and amygdala focus on the long-term potentiation and depression of excitatory synapses made onto dendritic spines. The titles of these papers each of which I hope to someday do a journal club on, should help emphasize this. Stably maintained dendritic spines are associated with lifelong memories. Do thin spines learn to be mushroom spines that remember? Dendritic spines, the stuff that memories are made of. Dendritic spines, morphological building blocks of memory. Getting back to our target paper, what Kasai et al. 2003 set out to determine is whether the functional strength of a dendritic spiny synapse is correlated with its physical size. A spiny synapse's functional strength is, by definition, a measure of how the presynaptic cells firing will affect the postsynaptic cells firing. And this is generally determined by probability and amount of glutamate neurotransmitter released by a presynaptic action potential, and the number of functional receptors, most importantly AMPA receptors, in the postsynaptic membrane. These biophysical traits have likely structural correlates as reviewed in this paper by Holtmott and Savota. The Probability and amount of neurotransmitter released is likely related to the size of the presynaptic axon's varicosity and the number of synaptic vesicles. And the number of functional receptors is likely related to the area of the postsynaptic density, or PSD, which holds receptors in place at the synaptic cleft. And as depicted here, all of these are correlated with each other. The authors summarize this by saying, there are indications that measurements of spine volume could provide an excellent indication of synaptic strength. The Kasai paper reviews evidence for this. Kasai et al. first reviews papers, like this one by Nusser et al., that directly quantified the number of AMPA receptors on synapses by immunolabeling these AMPA receptors with antibodies bound to gold nanoparticles. In this way, they could see both the structure of the synapse and its AMPA receptor complement in high-resolution electron micrographs. I have highlighted here in green a dendritic spine and the postsynaptic density in yellow. Nusser et al. measured the postsynaptic density size, PSD size, and the number of gold nanoparticles labeling AMPA receptors, and showed that the number of AMPA receptors is proportional to the area of the PSD in a range of synapse types. And this result has been confirmed by other labs. But the main evidence the Kasai et al. paper offers to support this relationship comes from a technique called two-photon glutamate uncaging. I will depict this technique schematically in the next few slides before going over their main results. As reviewed in the Kasai paper, Matsuzaki et al. 2001 used a whole cell patch pipette to fluorescently label and record from CA1 pyramidal neurons in a fresh slice of rat hippocampus I have drawn here an extremely simplified schematic depiction of such a rat hippocampal slice, 
There are numerous pyramidal neurons embedded in a field of traversing axons. The pyramidal neurons have many dendritic spines that are making synaptic contacts with the traversing axons. But none of these processes are visible to the light microscope because they have not been fluorescently labeled yet. A patch pipette was used to fill one neuron with fluorescent dye, and this same pipette was used to precisely measure the currents generated from glutamate neurotransmitter being released at the synaptic contacts. This is a recording of a so-called miniature excitatory postsynaptic current, or EPSC, presented in the Matsuzaki et al. paper. These miniature EPSCs are the result of one synaptic vesicle filled with glutamate being released at one synaptic site onto this patched neuron. These spontaneous vesicle release events happen frequently and at random in the slice. As you can see, each generates a current of a few tens of picoamps at the soma because the released glutamate binds to amper receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, opening the amper receptor's ion channel. Matsuzaki et al. bathed the slice with a compound called MNI glutamate, which is an inactive form of caged glutamate that can be released when light is shined on it. Let that sink in. Using this two-photon glutamate uncaging technique, they could use a tightly focused laser light, effectively illuminating only submicron sized volumes, to release glutamate at whatever precise location and time they desired within the hippocampal slice. The first thing they did was to verify that they could use this two photon glutamate uncaging to produce synaptic currents of similar magnitude to those seen in natural vesicle release. Here is an animation that should help visualize this. The two photon laser is uncaging MNI glutamate in the vicinity of this large dendritic spine. And the resulting AMPA channel openings are recorded at the soma as a small blip of current entering the cell. Matsuzaki et al. determined the proper laser intensity and duration necessary to give a current response similar to that seen in natural vesicle release. Quoting from the paper, the currents induced by focal two-photon uncaging of MNI glutamate were almost identical to miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents. Then Matsuzaki et al. showed that they could scan the two-photon laser across a region of the dendrite to create a picture of the AMPA receptor density at all places along the dendrite. This resulted in images that look like this. On the left is a fluorescent image of the small section of dendrite that is being scanned by the two-photon uncaging laser. In the middle is a recording of the current measured by the patch pipette at each point during the laser scanning, overlaid into the same coordinate space as the original fluorescent image of the dendrite. Note the color scale at the bottom. Blue pixels mean that laser uncaging at this location only produced five picoamps of AMPA current, but orange means that the laser uncaging at this location produced 20 picoamps. And the right image is a cleaned up version of this showing only the current response for regions directly on the dendrite. It can be clearly seen that the large mushroom shaped dendritic spine at the bottom responded with the most current. All this implies that there is a high density of AMPA receptor channels at this location on the dendrite. The authors performed this same analysis across many dendrites and plotted the AMPA current measured against the dendritic spine head's volume as measured in the fluorescent image. Here is one plot of this AMPA current versus spine head volume, showing that there is a roughly linear correlation between the two. The data points on the graph correspond to the numbered synapses on the left. And here is a plot showing the results of many more such measurements. Each of these dots is a measurement of a single dendritic spine synapses AMPA current response, plotted versus its spine head volume. 
it is clear that the true biophysical strength of a spiny synapse, as defined by its amphoreceptor response, is at least roughly correlated with that spine's physical size. The Kasai lab replicated and extended these results in this 2011 paper by Noguchi et al., in which the same two-photon glutamate uncaging technique was used, uh, this time on cortical pyramidal cells in a living mouse's brain. As you can see, they found a similar correlation between dendritic spine size and AMPA receptor response. This basic thesis that the strength of a spiny synapse is proportional to its size has, in the 15 years since the Kasai et al. paper, been tested in a whole range of studies using different experimental conditions, from electron micrographic studies of morphological changes in dendritic spines following long-term potentiation, to two-photon glutamate uncaging studies that actually induce LTP in individual spines and show that their volume grows accordingly. And even studies that showed that specific memories can be erased by shrinking the specific dendritic spines that had enlarged to encode those memories. In fact, to a certain extent, the entire field of electron microscopy-based connectomics is betting on this assumption. And initially successful connectomics studies, like this paper by Lee et al., offer yet more evidence in its favor. Now let me very briefly address the relevance of this particular paper to the ongoing brain preservation debate. A concern I often hear expressed is that even if we can theoretically preserve the information content of a human brain today using a technique like aldehyde-stabilized cryopreservation, future neuroscientists will nonetheless be unable to decode the information stored in this preserved brain without a molecular level scan that can identify each and every receptor protein and ion channel. Now, considering that ASC is based on glutaraldehyde fixation, which is already known to preserve the locations and identities of receptor proteins and ion channels, this is not really a fundamental objection as far as I'm concerned. It is more an argument that it may take much longer than some hope to extract the preserved information. That said, I still think the objection is overlooking the fact that neuroscience has uncovered so many correlations between the nanoscopic structure of the nervous system and its molecularly defined biophysical functioning. The studies that I just reviewed serve as a case in point. It could have been that the biophysical strength of a synapse had no correlation with its physical size as viewable by electron microscopy. But this turned out not to be the case. Instead, study after study has shown a relatively tight structure, stability, function relationship, just as the Kasai et al. paper reviewed. Thank you for listening, and thank you for keeping an open mind regarding what advances in neuroscience might bring in the future. These videos are designed to spark conversation and debate, so please feel free to leave comments below. I look forward to reading them.